Good morning, everyone. It is Monday, the 24th of January, uh, 2022, and welcome to Perspectives. Wherever you are this morning, we thank you for joining us. Welcome to the broadcast. Of course, all the broadcast entities streaming us, welcome, especially to those of you viewing us on MTV. MTV, we are both on air and online with you. Mikey Live, Party Grenada, TNR Communications, Sister Az in Caracou, Pity Martinique, and our own Perspectives page. I am Brenda Batiste. Good morning, everyone. And uh, say a special good morning to our expert talk panelist of Senator Christopher Daly and Mr. Byron Campbell. Good morning, gentlemen. Welcome. Good morning, Brenda, and good morning to our viewers and our listeners. Again, it's a pleasure to be here again. One more Monday morning. We fastly come into an end in January, Byron. Um, January is quickly moving away. And, um, you know, they always say it's one of the longest months <laughs> because we're all there again in December. But, um, yeah, and, um, you know, we here again, um, had lovely weather in the last few days for the guys of us, those of us who do our... Who have peas, eh? Yes, <laughs> who have a little in the, in the agriculture, the peas and so on. So I suppose um, the farmers who are in that area is having fun. Yeah, a lot of peas, yeah. Morning, good morning. Um, all listeners, viewers, uh, again, another Monday morning, um, the last Monday in January. No, we have in, one more, the 31st. Have the, oh, wow, okay. The last Monday is next Monday. Next Monday, uh -huh. okay, so I'm, I'm kind of, I'm, I'm anxious. Yeah, you don't get to that I'm anxious, um, but, but um, interesting um, weekend for me, Chris. Um, I get, uh, you know, I'm an open water swimmer, meaning I swim not along the beach, I swam out. along the coast, not out, along the coastline, you know. And um, yesterday I was at um, Dragon Bay, uh, Molinier Point, PT, PT, PT4. That's, that's a marine protected area. But, mm -hmm. but two things caught my eyes there, Chris. One is that there's spear fishing taking place there, open and wild tourists are, are, are in the water snorkeling and so on. This is dangerous to start with, but secondly, um, it's depleting the, the whole purpose of a marine protected area, having spear fishing. So I, I think that, that, that what we need there is certainly a bit more monitoring, you know, certainly. But I've seen some improvement in, in those waters there in terms of species. But the other thing that catch my eyes that, that Chris, is, is, um, is along that area, that coastline, there is what we call dry forest. So you have a lot of uh, uh, species of trees that grow in that area, and you have certain animal, um, that, that's where they, you know, like, like iguana, certain bird species, and so on. So it's very important habitat for these species. But what I noticed the interesting is that the gourmet trees are now being affected by, and that's a dominant species of tree along the dry forest area there. And it's being um, affected by the scale insects. So you have blights, and so it doesn't look very good at all. This is just to say that the, the scale insect is not only affecting traditional agriculture, whether it's salsa or guava or mangoes, but it is now affecting um, um, forestry species. So that, that is something to note. This, this, this problem is, is, is national. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I suspect that, um, you know, the whole issue of climate change and its effect across the nation, whether it be the rainforest, the dry forest, and what is happening, I know we have a special attack with this scale insect mm -hmm. on, on our various mm -hmm. trees. I mean, mm -hmm. it's something that needs to be more widespread, I suspect, dealt mm -hmm. with. And, of course, the deed and the question is going to be how do our environmental officers monitor and, mm -hmm. you know, prioritize where are the areas we need to... Um, look at, as, mm -hmm. I mean, and the dry forest is very critical for our bird, our bird mm -hmm. population mm -hmm. and the various species that they and how they breed and what mm -hmm. they do. So mm -hmm. that is, I mean, and there are a lot of other things that the dry forest contribute to as well. That's right. In yeah, terms yeah. of um, control of beaches and erosion. That's and correct. That and so Significant, so yeah. It's a big thing. So uh, again, Byron, that's a good observation that, mm -hmm. you know, we need to attack this thing holistically mm -hmm. and, um, and not just concerned about way. just the fruit yeah. trees yeah. and yeah. Yeah. And that's all that stuff. So, yeah. so, yeah, so the other yeah. point, Chris, um, Brenda, is um, the, the, the IMF concluded its 2022 um, virtual mission staff report in Grenada, and this was out, I think, just over a week ago. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the, I think the, looking at the report, it was favorable because just, just to just mention, for example, the Grenada economy is gradually recovering from the pandemic. The main risk is the 
to the outlook is, is a prolonged pandemic with implications for recovery of the tourism and education sector. But the, in general, it was a, a, a favorable report. But I was looking at some reactions to the report, both in terms of the newspaper and some political um, commentators, and that point to know that how authentic, how, how authentic is a virtual mission? Um, what able to verify documentation and information? You know, these kind of questions. <laughs> but I just want to say- People actually said that? Yes, yes, wow. I read it. But, but this is-, this is you're providing the same documents. <laughs> They're just not physically present. I, I, exactly. Yeah. That's the point I want to make because yeah. I, I have participated wow. in, in several virtual <laughs> missions um, with, with the International Fund for Agricultural Development and the Caribbean Development Bank. And the rigidity and the standard doesn't change in a virtual mission. No. All documentation had to be verifiable, and, uh, verified. And so, in fact, I am more comfortable with a personal mission than a virtual mission. Virtual mission is a lot more tense because, um, and they speak to everybody just the same and mm -hmm. documentation has a very far. So I think uh, it's very powerful. So many, I think this is a myth. You know how yeah. many company audits, fraud investigations yeah. Yeah. and so on are being done virtually yeah. at yeah. this yeah. time? Yeah. Not, what not, are we not, really not, saying? Not only at this time. Yeah. It has started many years yes. ago. Yes, what are we uh, saying? Business, we upload stuff to our right. auditors virtually, yeah, digitally. And oh I mean, this is, this is nothing that is New folks actually, uh, actually so, so said question, that? questions like um, how do they know the unemployment? They haven't been on the ground to see, or um, uh, you know, this kind of question. Or did they talk to the unions? Or did they talk? The standard is the same. The same. That's what I, am, I know. I am quite aware that they spoke to the private sector on many fronts. Yeah. Yeah. They spoke to yeah. the financial yeah. institutions. Yeah. Yeah. They spoke to the chamber. They, they, they have been speaking as the as key they performance normally, indicators yeah. does not change. Do. Yeah. yeah, and they speak to the NGOs and the independent parties to get a different view from the government. Right. So, right. And that is how they formulate and, and so, structure their yeah. report. Yeah. Yeah. It's favorable. If it said the report says that the authorities' comprehensive response has been critical in limiting the impact of the pandemic, fiscal policy in the near terms aims to continue supporting the vulnerable building resistance, et cetera, et cetera. That's their findings. That's yeah. not the, the government of Grenada can't <laughs> tell you to say that. And this is an independent um, report. Yeah. If it's favorable, it's favorable. Yeah, I mean, I, uh, mean, I, mean it, I suppose politically, yeah. for the people in outside of government, it's not a good report. No. You know, although I think, you know, yeah. we need to rise above that, that kind mm -hmm. of politics. If Grenada has done well in terms of an independent third party evaluating our, our economics yeah. and what we yeah. have done, yeah. especially in a pandemic situation, and mm -hmm. they're getting a favorable report in most parts, it is something to be proud, proud about as a peaceful right. and as a country That's that correct. we have done That's well. Correct. That's correct. Uh, yes, yes, it could be this party or another party, but mm -hmm. the point is they have done well. Mm -hmm. You know, but um, that, to me, yeah. those are cheap kind of political I points so, to score yeah. because so. at the end of the day, yeah. we as a people and a yeah. country is what yeah. we have to think about, yeah. not the individuality yeah. Yeah. of the exactly. parties and the politics. Exactly. Yeah. So I don't know. That is, uh, <laughs> it's true, Brenda, it's true. Chief uh, is check, a very check, kind check, word. Yeah. Check yeah. local newspapers and read the analysis. You see, you see, that's the thing. Um, 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 I, I'm very, um, because I'm an avid reader, yeah. and reading is like breathing to me, Right. Yeah. I am very careful about what comes into my space. Okay. And um, yeah. if I have been, you know, you know, there's a, there's a certain publication that seemed to have had an avid interest in me for whatever reason, yeah. painted me negatively when I was in the media. But you're a celebrity, so though. I don't participate. <laughs> you're you're still in the media, Brenda. I'm not a celebrity. I'm just an <laughs> average girl, woman, you know. You're a celebrity. The papers yeah, make you a celebrity. Just, when I have <laughs> absolutely no idea. I would never so, assign celebrity to me. Yeah, I understand. Yeah, I um, <laughs> it comes to the territory. Yeah. <laughs> no, again, it's back to the cheap politics, and it's um, back to people yeah, not, yeah, you know. Yeah, and yeah, my yeah, picture yeah, was yeah. put there like this big ogre, <laughs> and I was supposed to be having this fight on t with Franca Bernadine. Yeah. We never had a fight with a woman. We, oh, we were yeah. both shocked. Okay. We were both shocked. Okay. You know, yeah. and then, well, don't talk for when the situation happened with me yeah. and Nazim Burke. Oh, they went to town on me. Yeah. So there are certain things I don't read. But there are some, I'll tell you what, though, the Grenadian voice is still really good. Yeah. Because yeah. <laughs> yeah. you, 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 you frequent Carrick. Well, I was in Carrick who um, just, well, not last week, week before, recently, and uh, for what? three days and um, it was it's interesting from the point of view how, how I observe you know character and developments taking place there um, construction was certainly uh, a big deal there it is but but, but our mission they had to do with um, 
looking at the water situation, the, the wells and dams situation that are used primarily for agricultural livestock. Mm -hmm. And construction is using some of that water also because there's competition for water now in Karakou. But um, I, 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 and you know that the Karakounians, they have been um, so resilient and, and, and water for them has been a deliberate factor. You know, we take water here for granted, but in Karakou, there's always a shortage of water. Uh, remember, they're depending on the systems and collection and storage is important here. There's no, I mean, there is a, a level of desalin desalination taking place, but this is not enough to satisfy the... But, but we were looking there with engineers and looking at how uh, it, we could rehabilitate and, and enhance um, the, the, systems. The, 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 the systems because when you look at the, 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 the productive agricultural capacity for the island, it's, it's quite, and livestock development also, and water seems to be the underlying issues. The constraints. So I'm pleased that, yeah, yeah, the constraints. So I'm pleased to see that intervention is going to take place, and this is seen as a low-hanging fruit, something that could be done pretty quickly, like mm -hmm. within the next couple of months. You know? Yeah, it has been, um, Karakou and Petit Martinique in particular yeah. have yeah, always had yeah. issues with their water, water. supply and yeah. how they use it and have been very careful. Mm -hmm. But the mm -hmm. agricultural um, use of water, which mm -hmm. is, you know, you tend not to want to use treated water mm -hmm. because at the cost and yeah. agriculture yeah, yeah, responds yeah, better yeah, to yeah, untreated yeah. water. You, you know? don't want that salted water too. That's uh, right. Well, I mean, the, the, well, there's some salt. The, the desal water the is pretty pure. Yeah. Okay. The, point, the problem with desal water for agriculture and these other uses is the cost. Okay. It's not feasible from a cost point of view to mm -hmm. constantly be using the desal okay. water. So the desal water, yes, is there. It's a good buffer and a good um, thing for the the people of Karakou and Piti Marti you know, they guaranteed a consistent supply of portable water, water. that can be yeah. used. Mm -hmm. The issue now is for agriculture and livestock, as you say, which mm -hmm. you primarily don't want yeah. to use that type yeah. of water. Yeah. And here comes the cisterns and the value of the cisterns yeah. and, reva and revamping them yeah. and yeah. getting them back in use. So I think that's mm -hmm. an excellent move and project. Mm -hmm. yeah. you know, and the cisterns are still there, structurally. They're still structurally still there. Yeah, and, and most of them are intact. You yeah. know, they have minor yeah. repairs and yeah. cleaning and clearing. Exactly, that's the point. Yeah. And so on, but it's, it's, it's something that you yeah. can get back and, and mm -hmm. as you say, could activate within And the farmers time. are interested they're part of this and, and right. in terms of the yeah. maintenance and so forth. I remember Karakou have traditionally over the years been a large producer of things like yeah. lime and yeah. peas yeah. and you know we used to yeah. be grown up there of course. Yeah. many yeah. years ago. Yeah. And I say Karakou are the sweetest bees. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I don't <laughs> And I mean the blackberry sheep is a big thing. You know, so. you know those are things we need to encourage and go back to. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I'm pleased. The other, the other thing about there is that uh, you know the, the, the tourism potential of oh, that yes. island is oh, just yes. amazing and I don't think we are close to marketing its full potential. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah. I mean, I could tell you, in the pandemic time, there was a surge up there because a lot of Grenadians and um, other people I suspect... That included um, you, Chris? Yes, yes. <laughs> Karakou is one of my favorite places. And um, it is a, it's, it's a lot of us went there to relax and, yeah. you know, and the, the um, accommodation in Karakou have significantly improved over mm -hmm. the last few years. Okay. And the people of Karakou have lifted their standards mm -hmm. as well. You can get it's restaurants good. with really good, good tasting yeah. food. and. Well, it's yeah. time to launch Kayak Master. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, time to launch is, Kayak is it Master. On? Is using it, on? it for the pilot, for the big. I just saying anything. You know me, I like thing. Yeah, I like mass. Yeah. <laughs> it's a virtual mass. So, yeah. listen, it has to be blended. That virtual thing, yes, we have we capture the space, we have the space, we're not going back. But at this point in time, it just it has to be blended. But having said that though, we gotta step on out and come back. We have a big show for you this morning. <laughs> we have a special guest with us. We're gonna be examining the COVID-19 vaccine hesitancy survey report 2021. Cadres was commissioned to do that by USAID and UNICEF, and Peter Wickham, the principal director of Cadres and renowned political consultant. He's our special guest panelist this morning. Of course, we're going to talk about the hesitancy uh, survey. Um, Mr. Wickham is going to walk us through that. And of course, once he's here, politics must be something that we talk about. We take a quick break. Grenadians at home and in the diaspora, let's celebrate our 48th anniversary as an independent nation, overcoming adversity, safeguarding livelihood, protecting our future. Events to observe the 48th anniversary of our independence include National Colors Day and Interministerial Display, along with the virtual staging of the Independence Calypso Monarch Competition at the Kirani James Athletic Stadium on Friday, February 4th, February 5th from 7 p.m. Cultural Extravaganza. 
Manny James Athletic Stadium. Both events will be carried live via GIS Channel 22, GIS Facebook and YouTube channel, and the National Celebrations Committee Facebook page. The National Ecumenical Service Grenada Trade Center, 3 p.m. Sunday, February 6th. Then on Monday, February 7th, Independence Day. It's the Military Parade and Rally, 10 a.m. at the Kirani James Athletic Stadium. Happy 48th Grenada. Welcome back to Perspectives. If you're just joining us this morning, welcome to the broadcast. Well, because of the situation with the COVID-19 in this part of the region and uh, a limited uh, COVID-19 uh, vaccine uptake, it has been an issue, of course, for our, our countries, governments, people. And so the USAID and the UNICEF, they commissioned a survey across the region the country surveyed were Barbados, Dominica, Grenada, St. Lucia, St. Vincent and the Grenadines, and Trinidad and Tobago. And they enlisted the Caribbean Develop, De Development sorry, Research Services, Inc., that is CADRES, to conduct the survey. The principal director of CADRES is none other than Mr. Peter Wickham, and he's here with us this morning to talk us through that survey. Good morning, Peter Wickham. Uh, good morning, Thank you for the invitation and the this morning. Yeah, well, thanks, Eric. Peter, you, you're kind of uh, a little pu a pumpkin vine Grenadian, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I actually have a relative that is very good, so I, I can make some pain to uh, the Harry Luke. <laughs> <laughs> How interesting. <laughs> yeah, how interesting, Peter. So, Peter, you conducted your, 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 um, your agency, Cadres. You guys were uh, commissioned to do this survey. Um, just tell us um, the time frame you had to do, do, do this in and talk to us about the sampling, especially in Grenada, um, as to the, the, the type of sampling and the demographic that you enlisted for to find the, the responses for this survey? Okay, well, yeah, we, we received the call here and we said, okay, the principal agency, um, US aid was the principal funding agency, and we sent it to the principal coordinating agency. And we received the call from there around October, and uh, they basically said, you know, we need to get it out pretty quickly and conclude it very fast and then just survey all of these items. The, the identification of items were based on items that have the proportionality in terms of the number of people who are identified. The constituency is normally political, but it's more an official frame of reference in most instances because that's a, a frame in which we actually count how many people are really living. So, so that was the, the logic uh, in terms of the selection. Uh, we, we did three age groups, 18 to 30, uh, 31 to 50, 51 and over. Uh, those are the three age groups we used. Those give us critical mass in terms of age reference, and that's the reason why we do it. So we just split them into three. Uh, males and females, of course, we, we would have chosen half and half, 50 and 50. On this instance, we did a third demographic in that we wanted to find out, we wanted to ensure that we interviewed at least 40% of people who had children. So interviewers were told uh, gender and age, of course, but then also trying to find that 40% uh, of people who had children. 
6%. That is generally speaking the ratio of children across the region. I appreciate that in Grenada it's, it's always different. It's not exactly that in each island, but that is generally the, the, the region that we work within that. Right, right. That's, that's basically the, the demographic uh, picture. Okay, great. Um, according to your report, there were varying levels of initial hesitancy in each of the countries, with the highest level in Grenada and the lowest in St. Lucia. So expand on that a bit for us, Peter Wickham. And also, can you give us a profile of the vaccine-hesitant person in Grenada? Yeah, I think what you're reading is the... Um the what well, you could call the Grenada version of the report, mm -hmm. uh, and naturally in this Grenada as the highest, but technically speaking, Grenada isn't um, the, the highest level of hesitancy. Because one of the things we did is we generated an index, which is based on three questions. One of which is um, the actual national data regarding vaccination levels. So Grenada is, I think, I think Grenada is third overall. Okay. If, if all of the countries are listed. Uh, Grenada has a hesitancy level of 4.4. Uh, Barbados has a 3.9, mm -hmm. and the uh, overall objectives that Grenada set that UNICEF set was a 3.0, which is the base mm -hmm. that we're working towards. Um, in terms of the Grenada profile of unvaccinated persons, uh, I think that that's particularly interesting. The unvaccinated person in Grenada is uh, equally male or female. I mean, we had a statistically insignificant difference between the two. So more of them were female, but it's literally 49% to 51, so we say that it's pretty much the same. Uh, in terms of age group, the unvaccinated people were younger. Uh, in terms of education level, the unvaccinated persons were educated only to the secondary level, which is the case for most mass majority of Canadians. And in terms of employment, uh, the unvaccinated persons are generally not working, or alternatively not working in the formal sense of being working in an office and institutional environment. And in terms of why they're not vaccinated, uh, the majority response among unvaccinated people is that it's a choice, and they choose not to get vaccinated. Um, the comparison regionally is important here because what we found is that across the board, generally men were more likely to be unvaccinated, while in Grenada it was, it was equal. Men and women are equally likely to be unvaccinated. Um, the useful perspective on unvaccination is totally correct. Younger people in Grenada and across the region are more likely. Education identical to the regional profile. And the fact that they're not working, again, also identical to the regional profile. And then in terms of the uh, reasons why people are unvaccinated, Across the region, the trust of the vaccine is usually a larger factor, mm. while in Grenada, it's really a question of choice. People choose not to, to take the vaccination. So that's the, the profile, and I find the profile is particularly useful. There, there is one other issue in relation to the profile that I wanted to mention, and this is the whole question of politics. Um, we did not ask a political question on the Grenada uh, survey largely because that, uh, UNICEF's policy is that we cannot right, ask yeah. uh, political questions yeah. in the survey that you're doing. We did, however, do it in a s different survey that we did in Barbados. And we were able to supply information from Barbados from an unrelated survey that asked a political question. And what we found was the most powerful impediment, the most powerful uh, factor in terms of the unvaccinated in Barbados was <clears throat> the fact that they did not support the government. Um, and I think that that's critical because my anecdotal belief is that across the region, one of the key factors in terms of people not taking the vaccine is that they either don't trust the government or they don't support the government, which is interesting because there's political dimension to it. Uh, in Grenada, in St. Vincent and Grenadines, this is particularly strong, where you know you see in terms of the supporters of the government and, and persons that are in the government, um, there's almost a 100% vaccination that persons who oppose the government. Uh, you know, there's, there's probably like 30% vaccination right. level. So that's, a, that's an interesting one that we were able to pull out. And, <laughs> and to me, it says that, you know, this issue has been completely put in Right, yeah. While you mention it's anecdotal, I guess, because of the science of your survey, I think we, we actually live it, and it is a reality. Just before I let Senator Daly come in, you brought up the issue of trust and people not trusting the government and who supported did it and who support, um, did not support didn't do it. What, about the, what did you find, or, 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 or just you know, generally, what about the trust of vaccine themselves 
or the trust of science, the superstition of the Caribbean person? Yeah, that was the second one. So in Grenada, 60% of people who were unvaccinated um, didn't, were not vaccinated because they didn't trust the science. Mm -hmm. uh, what I did find, though, honestly, was that there's a bit of, um, in terms of the unvaccinated person, there's a bit of, it's, it's peculiar because it just seems as though the lack of trust as a reason is significantly important among some people more than others. So in other words, you have two, two young people who are, you know, uh, both fit the categories in terms of education and whatnot. Um, one of them doesn't trust the vaccine and the other one does trust the vaccine. Uh, and the difference is that one of them is, is supporting the government and one of them is opposing the government. So yes, people say trust in the vaccine. And I, I get you that that is a, a significant and certainly legitimate reason why people don't want to take it. At the same time, however, I find it is layered on top of something else right. that creates this gotcha. issue. Gotcha. Um, and yeah, politics is one. Education is also, you know, uh, people who are, are educated to a higher level appear to have more confidence in vaccination. Uh, I should point out that, and related to the best of my knowledge, um, you, you can't go to school unless you're vaccinated against uh, measles, much better, you know, polio and so on. Uh, I don't know whether Grenada is different, but that's the, the standard across the region. So the idea of not trusting the vaccine in a sense is, is a bit uh, odd, because I think that, that we're all vaccinated and we have these little circular scars. Right. Which I find I hear they don't do anymore. <laughs> <clears throat> Senator Diali. Good morning, Peter. Good to have morning, you as morning. usual Good. and to get your views. I, I, I too was reading your report with great um, interest because I, I singled out the issue of 51% um, felt they wanted more scientific information about the vaccines, 40% uh, had side effects um, concerns, 30% dealing with sexual health and, and so on. And I listened to you about this trust level and the politics that is intermingling. And my question is, you know, we have been in this program talking about the message and the messengers and who these people are and how to get people over the line to get them more vaccinated. Now, when I hear 51% speak about needing more scientific information and not trusting the science, my question to you is the how. Because on this program here, we in the past would have brought in a, a gentleman called Dr. Olds from the University, St. George's University, who is a specialist, a virologist, and have been in this for many years. And when they were talking about the speed of developing the vaccine, and he spoke about that to many forums in Grenada, you have this issue of still people are not believing what is being said by the, the expert. So the question in my mind is, how do we do this? Do we change the messengers? Um, you know, move it away from the political or the party in power. What is it that we need to do to get people to understand that, yes, there have been research, this is factual information. Many doctors have come and said, yes, you know, the, the coronavirus is something we have been researching for quite a while. So when I read your report and I saw that, I, I thought there was um, hope, first of all, that we could convince, but my question is the how and who you know, do we use to get this message across? Yeah, uh, you're asking a powerful and important question. Um, and I, I, I sadly have to tell you that um, I, I don't know what the mechanisms are. You know, the part, part of the thing is that I... Indeed, I, I have to walk more delicately because I appreciate that, you know, you're working for an organization that is committed to being non-political. Um, I don't really know that there's a lot that you can say to a person who is unvaccinated. And, and one of the things which I try to communicate about this report is that there is a core of people in Grenada that will not take the vaccine unless they absolutely have to. If you ask those persons, they will say they don't trust. Um, in the case of Barbados, the trust factor was explored. Government put out a, a special commission that was designed to go around the country and go to towns and villages and whatnot and answer people's scientific questions that they asked and whatnot. What happened is that people came out to those, those events determined to prove the doctors wrong. <laughs> and then one of the complaints that we had was that, oh, but those panels were not balanced because everybody in the panel was pro-vaccination. The, the, the reality, Senator, is that I don't think that we're going to get to a stage where you are going to be able to convince the unbelieving that the scientific evidence is robust. Because 
you will tell people that there's good science. You will bring doctors or professors or whatnot, and they will say, you know, we don't trust them. Mm -hmm. And they don't trust them on the basis of something that they read on the internet. Mm -hmm. You know, we had a, a, an engineer standing up at one of the, the, the sessions in Barbados, and, you know, he went on and on talking all kinds of conspiracy theories that he pulled out of goodness knows where. It's an engineer that fixes cars and, you know, and machines. Um, he was confounding the doctors there because he was just not moving in relation to a conversation about scientific um, evidence. And then something like vaccine ingredients, you know, people go in KFC and, and all about and eat, eat all kinds of foolishness and, and, you know, they go to the store and they buy robot tested and they, they never start to ask what's in it. But yet still in terms of this vaccine, there's critical information that people need to know about what's in it. Polio, MMR, none of those vaccines that we don't know what's in it, and they inject us all the time. Yeah. So I don't think that there is much wiggle room, quite frankly, to get people persuaded. I think that the persuadable have already been persuaded because governments have bent over backwards in Grenada and all over the region to provide information. I think that you're dealing with a situation now where you have to ask yourself, what are the critical groups that need to be vaccinated? And how can you use mandates effectively to get those groups vaccinated? And if persons do not want to be vaccinated, that's fine. I mean, they have the right not to be. There has to be a, a consequence in the sense that they have to understand, look, you know, if you're not going to be vaccinated, there are certain precautions that you have to take for your protection and for the protection of others. It sounds harsh, but ultimately that's the way it is. Um, you, your prime minister took a position before that he is not um, in, engaging in any vaccine mandate talk. Um, simply because he, he doesn't believe that, you know, he needs to do that. Uh, and he said, you know, that if you don't want to take it, you don't. But there are consequences. And I, I think that's an entirely reasonable position in terms of dealing with this. That This idea that there's something you can tell people magically that will convince them to take it, I think that we have passed that a long time ago. And it's really now about saying, okay, do we need mandates in the hospital? Do we need mandates among elderly people or people's homes? You know, how do we protect the innocent in this regard um, and persons who are committed? Then, you know, what are the consequences and how, how are they supposed to live their life outside of infection um, areas? And, and, you know, Peter, the irony of all of this, I mean, I'm in business and, and I could tell you the frustrations we have in business in those of us who have unvaccinated staff and vaccinated and the, the risks that it poses us in our environment. And you're so correct that at a certain time, there is just nothing more I think you can say to convince people who doesn't want to go the route of vaccination. But the irony of, of all of this is that if we have to travel now and go to the US or, well, England is an interesting exception now, but yeah. other places, you must be vaccinated and they will take it without any hesitation if they need to go and get a visa and so on. But when it comes to your own national um, safety and guidelines, you, there seem to be a resistance. And that's why I think your comment, I support your comment on two fronts, the, mand the mandatory part, because I think that is something, as countries, we need to um, identify critical areas of our society where we believe, our school children is one, for example, I've always said publicly that I believe mandating for our school children between mm -hmm. 12 and 17 is something we should not hesitate on. But that is my opinion, but I believe, as you said, there is this issue of, you know, where is the trust and is there a political overlay that's causing this and um, for people not to go one way or the next. But consequences will be made by decisions made positively or negatively on this issue, and I suspect that is a society that is going to evolve. As we say, the new normal that is coming, that is going to be part of the new normal. You know, very, very quickly, the, the Omicron variant appears to be, it's very, very virulent and strain. And, and, you know, in, in the United Kingdom, for example, they're basically saying, you know, everyone is going to catch it eventually. Yes. Um, once you leave your house on board, you will catch it. So the question is, do you want to catch it and get sick, or do you want to catch it and just not even notice? I mean, yeah. most people haven't, who are vaccinated haven't even noticed that they've been ill. Um, I think that that's a critical statistic, you know, and I may say to people who are at vaccines, look, you know, exercise your options because ultimately it's either you want to, to possibly end up on life support and then, or alternatively, you know, you want to, to have a fighting chance at life. And it's actually coming down to that kind of a choice now. So that, and, that to me is really goal for start. And the cost. Yeah. Some countries are saying if you're unvaccinated and you choose not to and you come in, you're going to have to now pay. It's no longer a free service, you yeah. know, Byron. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I want to, Peter, a very uh, timely report um, that, that I hope that um, the authorities in the regions would find it useful. 
But I just want to go back to the, the question of the compulsion, because in your report, uh, the question of uh, your report, you stated that Grenada is the only country where compulsion was a significant factor, which you stated is ironic um, since the government has resisted legislative um, uh, vaccine uh, mandates. Um, but you believe this is uh, uh, for political reasons? Do you think that, um, uh, wh why do you think uh, this is so, in, particularly in Grenada? Yeah, yeah. Um, another interesting question, Dr. Mitchell has said that he opposes mandates, but yet still a majority of people in Grenada who are vaccinated, a lot of them said they took it because they didn't have a choice, which is interesting because the word mandate has been misused, I think, uh, where people believe that someone is going to hold you down, force a needle into your arm, which, which is ironic because I remember back in the day, um, that's how they used to deal with kids that didn't that's want right. to take the vaccination. <laughs> <laughs> squeeze I, them. I am an example of that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, the nurses had a strategy where they have to take all the yeah. person, they stick each other yeah. between the person's yeah. leg, yeah. they clamp yeah. the legs yeah. together, and they're, you know? Yeah. But that, that's not what is on the cars now. I think it's more a situation where, for example, the Grenada um, Tourism Association has been fairly progressive in terms of saying that we're making our, our places no place, no, no vaccines on. So government didn't have to vaccinate, have to impose a mandate simply because people who work in that sector and want to continue working in that sector essentially did not have a choice. And a lot of them grumble and they went and take it and they go to work and you know they're happy earning a living. Um, in a sense, it shows how mandates really work and, and mandates really speak to a context. And this is presumably what Dr. Mitchell has, has done. Um, I, I have quite a few political clients in the region who have been opposed to mandates. Um, you know, Prime Minister Motley is one of them. Uh, Dr. Mitchell is one of them. Uh, for example, Gaston Brown, he, he has not um, hesitated to impose mandates, uh, and, and neither has Dr. Gonzalez. And the politics is interesting. My, my critical argument to all of them would be, look, the, 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 the politics are the penalties associated with not imposing mandates, or with imposing mandates, are relatively minimal. Because politically, those people who oppose mandates highly and who will be offended by the fact that they are forced to take a vaccination to go to work are not going to vote for you anyhow, or they're probably not going to vote for you anyhow. True. So you have nothing to lose. And, and in that regard, Gaston Brown was persuaded that you know it, he didn't have a lot to lose, so he imposed the mandates. No one even talks about it anymore. Um, the same in St. Vincent. I mean, they're still grumbling, but ultimately, you know, it is done, and this is you know the society has moved on. Um, so this had appallingly low vaccination levels, and there was something that had to be done. The, the thing in Grenada is that I think Dr. Mitchell probably assessed quite rightly that he could achieve the same objective based on letting you guys in the private sector do the hard work in terms yeah. of imposing mandates on your staff. And he said, you know, you have my blessing. Yes. Um, and and <laughs> it, it worked, and it worked well. But yes. there's a fair yeah. among politicians. Prime Minister Motley is in a similar situation where she feels that having all these seats both before and after, that, you know, she, she has to walk cautiously because people are saying she's a despot and a dictator. And they're using all kinds of colorful language, and she has opposed it. But I, I've said to her both publicly and privately that I think that opposing, for example, there's no mandate to, to be vaccinated to work in the Queen Elizabeth Hospital against COVID, but there's a mandate to work in the Queen Elizabeth Hospital against chickenpox. And I mean, chickenpox is generally speaking not deadly, um, but yes, still you, you have a, a, a virus like, um, but like COVID, which has been killing people. And a lot of the staff at the hospital are vulnerable because a lot of them are women. Uh, some of them are overweight, and, and, and the statistics have basically shown that that's a higher level of exposure to vulnerability. But a lot of them are unvaccinated and, and resistant to being vaccinated because they're saying they have the right not to be vaccinated. I, I think that governments have been a bit too, um, too uh, hesitant to, to, to use the, the force of legislation, and I think that a lot of the reasons are political. But, you know, I, I guess when you have all these seats like Dr. Mitchell and Prime Minister Motley, it is... The, the conversation is different because there's always a fear that you're abusing power. Yeah. And sometimes they take positions which may seem a bit of cowardice to us, but they do that simply because, you know, they're conscious of the fact that people are saying, you know, with all these seats, you can do what you want. Peter, you, you touched on the uh, Barbados survey. I think, I think it's important. I just want to bring it back here. Sure. Which, which th that, that survey suggested that unvaccinated persons are likely or more likely to support um, or, or to oppose the government. Um, how, um, and, and this uh, seemed to be evident, may be evident across the region. I mean, how concerned should be 
incumbent government be with such large um, uh, hesitancy level among the population, particularly where there's upcoming elections or where elections is due? Yeah, I mean, I would think that the opposition should be concerned um, because my thing is, it's one thing to talk about winning or losing an election, but it's another thing to talk about winning or losing lives. And the statistics will show that the opposition supporters are less likely to be there to support the opposition if they don't take this vaccination. And that's critical. You know, um, in the case of Barbados, the, the supporters of the Democratic Labour Party opposition are generally speaking older people. And I mean, statistically, I can prove this. I think in the case of, of Grenada, the NEC supporters are also more likely to be older people. Um, and, and that is one of the demographic realities that we face. So you are, as a result of your politics, exposing your primary voting population to dying in greater numbers. And, and you're doing so with brutal uh, forces saying, look, you know, this is a position that you think that you're likely to hold. The politics of it does not make sense because you are exposing your supporters to potential death. The, the challenge is that we have not been able, and I say we, using UNICEF and, uh, as a primary agency that's been moving in this stuff, we have not been able to get opposition um, characters to, uh, let's say, political characters in the pure sense, to, to get behind the messages and to tell their supporters, go and get vaccinated. You know, in, in Jamaica, um, you know, Lisa Hanna, who is a, one of the strongest opposition um, voices, has been doing a whole lot of work to get her supporters vaccinated because she understands that most of them are older people. And she's saying, look, let's arrange vaccination centers and community centers and so on here in America and they're advertising it. Come and get vaccinated, come and take the job. And she's been using her social media presence to do it. She is one of few opposition voices across this region that has been taking a responsible position. And this is the challenge that we're having, Chris, where we're having difficulties getting people to, to um, you know, understand in opposition that their, their, their language and their messaging needs to be one of encouraging their supporters to get vaccinated because ultimately government can't do it. Government can't tell their supporters to get vaccinated. The opposition needs to be on board in this regard. Bottom yeah. line, sorry. Bottom line, you seem to be saying, look, um, it, it is what it is. Look, uh, the, the numbers of unvaccinated persons are not likely, you're not going to see any mm. significant movement. So we have mm -hmm. to find mechanism, we have to find ways of living with the current situation. How realistic is this though, in terms of protecting the population? I, I think realistically, there's a, we, we don't really have a choice. Using the word choice again, that is, it, this is exactly what, what life is gonna be like for a while. Um, we went into this thing two years ago, thinking it was a three month exercise, you know, I'd like, um, you know, swine flu and, and uh, the, the other one we calls uh, the bovine flu. Um, it, it will be a quick thing that would pass. What we have found is that it has been with us for two years and we will be living with it for a long time. So to me, all of the precautions, including vaccination, is, is something that's relatively standard. And I think the, the idea that we, we have choices and options to the contrary, to me, is, is a bit of the delusion, quite frankly, because it's, it's going to be something that we're going to be living with for a while. And, you know, entering countries, um, I, I live in France, you know, half the year and, you know, I, I have a vaccine pass that gives me access to the gym. Um, no, my thing is, it's, it's very straightforward. If you don't want to go to the gym, then you can't be vaccinated. <laughs> but the fact is that in France, uh, and President Macron has been very clear, life is extremely uncomfortable for an unvaccinated person. You can't go to a library, you can't go to a party, you can't go to a restaurant, you can't have a drink anywhere, you know. Um, without showing a vaccination pass. And people are saying it's medical apartheid or vaccine apartheid. He's saying it's common sense because we're living with, uh, in a pandemic, um, a person who is unvaccinated costs the state significantly. And that's the next thing he's saying that persons who are um, unvaccinated will be taxed because yeah. they are more likely to end up on a, on a, a, mm -hmm. a, a, a yeah. Yeah. What do they call it? A uh, life support machine. Right? Yeah, yeah. And, um, and as a result, the state has to pay for it. Yeah. 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 The, the, one of the, the, the things that all, that's also very interesting going to the survey, PJ, is that um, we're having this big, robust discussion now about the safe opening of schools and the interaction with schools across the region. And there seems to be some differences in some territories about it. And your report cited this as well. And one of your direct questions in the survey were why are some persons hesitant about their children taking the vaccine? Mm. Talk to us about that dynamic. Yeah. 
and that's and that's interesting because in Grenada, people are there are a lot of people who are willing to take it that are hesitant about the children taking it, uh, and I think that is I guess it's probably a normal reaction. Um, one of my activities, one of my my side hustles, so to speak, is I, I run a calling program every Monday. Um, and one day I brought on a pediatrician, you know, a respected pediatrician, and we were overwhelmed with calls, people asking, you know, my child is, is, has allergy, can they take it? Um, my child has a growth issue, can I, can I take it? Um, one lady said, my child is already taking vaccination for um, cervical cancer, the, the uh, cervical cancer vaccine is so controversial, um, can they take it on top of that? And I mean, in all instances, you said yes, 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 yes. But what was interesting is that people had reservations, not for themselves, but for their children. Mm -hmm. Now, I know this to be the case from politics that, you know, invariably you, you can tell people you could do anything to them, but the children, you gotta be careful. So in terms of education, um, political parties in the region have done extremely well by educating people's children and educating them well. And you will find that a mother will continue to vote for you for decades after those children have been educated or moved on if they believe you educate the children. So you don't mess with people's children. And, and I think in Grenada, that is definitely a, a challenge where a lot of people are more concerned for the children than for themselves. So there has to be a specific level of, of education targeted to people to assure them, using pediatricians and other persons, that their children are safe, that the vaccine is not more offensive to the children. Uh, my understanding is that the, the testing has been pretty extensive among children and now uh, I believe below 12, it's, uh, up until 12, it's, 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 it's their dosages available, consistent with what we see with measles and mumps and rubella and all of those other uh, illnesses that affect children. Um, you know, so there, there is a, an option for children available and it needs to be, but I do accept that people are quite rightly more concerned for the children than they are for themselves. Uh, and the belief that the vaccine will do something to harm the children is critical. The, the challenge is that with schools, schools have been in the Caribbean and in Grenada, schools have been the primary vehicle for maintaining the health of children. Yeah. So in schools, you can study children's uh, gross weights and, and the, the height and the body weight. You can study that. You can also administer vaccination programs using the schools as a venue. And you can also use the uh, prohibition that you can't enter schools without certain vaccinations to ensure, for example, the polio, the polio campaign globally has been highly successful because it targets children in schools. And, you know, people want to send the children to school. So in order to do that, they take the polio vaccine and we line up and we take the sugar cube and, you know, you move on. Um, the, the, the challenge with, with COVID is we need to be able to do that because the schools are closed largely. Children are suffering perilously, and I don't think that people understand yeah. the long-term psychological impact. Mm -hmm. I met a kid who is, uh, well, he's now seven, and he, he was saying to me that he is at home playing, and the mother said that, you know, he's developed a play style that is very, very individualistic because he doesn't have any friends because he's mm -hmm. never been to school, yeah. you know? It's, and it's, it's really hard to yeah. see a kid being so isolated and not having any friends at that age simply because he's not school. And I mean, they're looking at this, this, uh, this iPad for, for, you know, several hours a day yeah. and not really taking on the person that is teaching them because schools, schools are important and we need to get them open. Vaccinations will help to get that done. Uh, and by all means, let's, let's do it. Yeah. In terms of the, the main sources of information, uh, we, we, we just can't let that pass. Uh, the way yeah. um, we have received our information, the, the sources of, of the information mm -hmm. about the vaccine. Um, just talk to us about uh, what you found about that and then impacts, Wickham. Yeah, right. So, I mean, there's a choice in terms of what are the main sources of vaccine. Like most people like uh, social media, television and so on. Uh, in Grenada, social media is, is, is the preferred um, information source. Um, the government is the source that people appear to trust most. Uh, and that is one that, you know, it needs to be put in our information. But yeah, it's clear that, you the know, government the social the, media... The, there's a difference, you know, uh, Peter Rico. There's the Ministry of <laughs> Health and there's the government. Are they intertwined in this? <laughs> I, I thought they were one of the same thing. <laughs> well, we call them official sources. I think that's how it's listed in the, uh, in the, in the survey. Right. Uh, official sources are the more reliable sources for the conveying of information. Um, and in instances in, in Grenada where you convey that official source, or the official source is a, a social media source, it definitely helps. Now, there's a big conversation about what social media targets what audience. 
Um, the older people uh, like us are into Facebook. The younger people, um, you know, are, are into uh, Instagram or whatnot. And I guess the idea is that in, in the case of Grenada, you would want to target the demographic that you're interested in speaking to using the source that is most familiar to them. Um, most of the ministries of health have fairly detailed information on, you know, the demographic profile of person who use different types of social media. Uh, and, and that's something that you can exploit in terms of understanding how to speak to people. But you, you broadcast using social media um, with the understanding that you know you want to reach out to certain people. And I think that that's that's something that we have to do with this COVID vaccine, that we have to use social media. Social media is the main source of disinformation. We also have it to make it the main source of, of information. And it has to be packaged in a way that, that gets in. One of the things that, that we found was very useful across the region is the uh, influencers. You know, where you have people who are social media influencers uh, who can use their social media power to create a buy in. Um, in Grenada, you, you have, um, you know, an Olympic track star who is the type of person that would be ideal to convey that message. Exactly. Uh, you also have a Formula One racing star who has Grenadian origins, uh, who has recently been knighted, incidentally. And congratulations to you on that. Welcome. Um, I, w I would think that these are the types of people who you can use just star power to get behind a message and say to people, you know, go to get vaccinated. Um, in the case of St. Vincent, we used uh, Keith Mitchell. Keith Mitchell was used, you know, before he died, um, you know, rest his soul. James uh, Mitchell. He was used, James Mitchell, sorry, James Mitchell, I'm sorry. <laughs> right. Um, my apologies to, to Keith. So, so, James, so James was used pretty heavily to convey a message to yeah. opposition type people that they should go and get vaccinated. And it was powerful. So the influencers, I, I, I'm liking how the influencers work in, in getting behind the message and getting people to go there. And you have, in Grenada, you, you're fortunate to have a couple that could be really powerful voices in, in conveying the message, assuming that they're on board with it. I, I know uh, uh, Sir Lewis is, I, I'm not sure about Karani. All right. Uh, so we, we're Change switching to game. politics, but before we wrap, there, yeah, any recommendations, uh, uh, Peter Wickham? Uh, we, we're hearing lots of, I mean, if the new political campaign just passed, that it was about how to convince people, what else yeah. can we do? Um, everybody felt that so much has been explored, but there's still more to do. So coming out of this, 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 this survey, and, and I must say this is really groundbreaking, um, and, and congratulations to you and, and, and your company and the collaborators and funders of this. But if you had to give a top three to, uh, in terms of advice to governments and, and, and agencies as to how you know, we can continue to get uptake, what would you advise or what would you recommend? Um, yeah, I mean, it's simple. Mandates, mandates, and mandates. That is, that is really what we have to do. Um, I think that the, the young people, which is clearly a demographic that is a bit uh, lazy in this regard, Excuse me, the young people have to be persuaded by way of mandates. So, for example, young people want to go to clubs and bars and whatnot. Um, you know, they stop a mandate on those environments, and, and, and they are likely, more likely to take it if, if they need it for that environment. Uh, as far as the working environment is concerned, maybe we need to look at more venues where there are mandates associated with working, because that will definitely be a way to get um, uh, up. Get, you know, uptake. Um, probably the third one is, is improving the communication in terms of, you know, targeting media and so on. But I think that there is really a lot of latitude where that's concerned. Uh, and I think that the main focus has to be on those demographics that are resistant, get people in those demographics to a situation where they do not believe that they have a choice in terms of getting the vaccination. Uh, so the young people, sadly, when a person is not working, there is not much opportunity to encourage that person to be vaccinated. Uh, so we have to find ways and means of, of speaking to that individual who is not working in an environment where he has to take a vaccination to go work in a hotel um, to try to get that person on board and, and using creative means. I think the social environment is, is one of them where if you have spaces which are safe, safe spaces, uh, and you do that by way of imposing mandates, then you're likely to get uh, that level of uptake. Sorry, one other thing that we noticed too was that um, the use of private doctors to administer vaccines seems to have been, you know, quite quite helpful. Um, I'm not sure why people are unwilling to take it from a nurse, but you know, they take it from their doctor. Mm, if that works, you know, knock yourself out. <laughs> interesting. So those are the key recommendations. All right. Thanks a lot, Peter. We come again. Great work there. But you know, once we have you, politics shall be on the menu. 
and so we switch it to that right away. Um, so let's start off in Barbados, uh, uh, your, your country. Peter, was it a uh, mission critical uh, for Prime Minister Motley to call the elections 18 months uh, before uh, it was constitutionally due? And secondly, uh, was any of the political parties your client? <laughs> Uh, the client thing is something that I keep get asked both in Grenada and Barbados, and it's a question I can't answer. Um, the, the identity of my, my clients can tell you whether I work for them, but I can't tell you whether I work for them. I got you. That's one of the commitments that we make. I got you. Um, so, so that's it. But the, the question of mission critical is interesting. Um, I recently heard Dr. Mitchell addressing the issue and saying that, in his opinion, the disruption imposed by an early election is not one that you feel you need to exercise to gain an advantage in a situation where you have all the seats. Yeah. Um, it's an interesting logic that I like. I, ironically, it was exactly what Prime Minister Motley said was her logic for going forward. She said that she needed to have an election to unite the country behind one message in terms of the fight against COVID. Um, my thing was that I thought that with all 30 seats, the country is pretty much united. You know, in Barbados, there's a lot of noise suggesting that Prime Minister Motley is unpopular and she's a dictator and this and that. And, you know, we use various regional forums where we see people coming out and attacking Prime Minister Motley. But, but the fact of the matter is that for the vast majority of Barbadians, she walks on water. And, and I don't know that, that people really take on the, the noise. Um, so if you ask me if I thought it was critical for her to call the election 18 months early, of course it wasn't. Um, I thought it was also ill-advised to call the election early. And, and I, I always made the point that this is a conversation I've also had with, um, with, with Prime Minister Gaston Brown in anticipation of his 18-month uh, early call that he made uh, on his previous time going out at the polls. Um, I, I'm kind of old-fashioned in the sense that I don't know that the disruption imposed by the election is necessary too early. And I also like fixed terms. Having said that, there is an obvious advantage strategically that a government gains from going early, especially when the opposition is as ill-prepared as they are now. And, you know, uh, I think that Dr. Mitchell, even though he said he isn't doing it, must be at some point in his mind wondering whether, you know, maybe this is a good idea, you know, you, 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 catch, you catch a fella um, with his pants down, literally, <laughs> and, and you spike him. And that's exactly what happened in the case of Barbados. The opposition was woefully unprepared. And, and, and stupidly so, in my opinion, because, you know, we're, we're told, yeah, you, you know, not the day, the time, nor the hour that the Son of Man cometh. And, and the reality is that the Son of Man, you know, can come like a thief in the night. And you got to be ready. You can't say, I'm not ready because, you know, I got some stew dumplings that I got to finish. You, got, you have to be ready. So I think that that's the message in it. I don't think it was critical. <clears throat> But ultimately, it's not my call, you know. Um, I, I can advise clients one way or the other, but, and I would usually advise them to go towards the, the full term. But you, you have the Dr. Mitchell position, and you have the Prime Minister Motley position. And I right. think that the two positions clearly have equal um, moral logic, but the strategic value of going early is, is clearly unquestionably a powerful inducement to, to press the button early. All right. Pastor Wickham with the sermon. I hand you over to Senator De Alley. Peter, Peter, my question to you is, is the modality in which the election was conducted by Prime Minister Motley and probably what we'll see coming up in Grenada um, this year into next year, depending on when Prime Minister Mitchell calls it. But um, I saw clips of um, Prime Minister Motley going out door to door, you know, and bouncing elbows and so on. But the question here is, with COVID and this environment, do you was it a case where she had any major large campaigns or it was or was mm -hmm. it a blend of that and the the um, social media mm -hmm. and the virtual you know it is showing a different mix as to how you campaign and yeah. my question has always been how do you excite your base to mm -hmm. to come on and to vote for you knowing that now that the you know the wine and dance and the artists and yeah. what we are accustomed to yeah. is no longer the the real mode now that we will have to use but, but you know, you know, it's interesting that in many of our social circles, well, our political circles also, we, we complain about, about the wine and dance politics. And we, we think that the idea of having a fete where you, you uh, dye the, the, the bare green and give it away as a political promotion, 
uh, offends a lot of us because we feel that politics has gone in a direction it should not go. Mm -hmm. So what we have found, and this is fascinating because we've had eight elections during COVID uh, and, and all of them have been largely virtual. Um, they have been a lot more digestible in terms of the substance of what is coming out. Sure. Uh, the packages are presented in a way that I have been able, and I, as I said earlier, I live in France, uh, I've been able to follow, watch, yeah. and participate in election coverage in all of these places, you know, from a perch that was thousands of miles away. And I, I love it, quite frankly. And, and the, the, the great thing about the platforms is that a lot of cussing and bacchanal and that kind of thing has completely and totally disappeared because mm -hmm. politicians don't appear to be excited enough to cuss one another and to talk about their family background and different things about their personal character. They don't, they don't like to do that on the internet because they know that somewhere in the world, some old lady is sitting in front of her uh, computer screen at 2 o'clock in the morning watching what's this behavior yeah. you know, that is going on. Mm. So True. that's been a major impact. Uh, and, and in Barbados, no different. The, the, the campaigns were virtual. The COVID unit met with, after the election was called, it met with the parties and it got the parties to agree to have no more than three major meetings. Uh, and all the rest being what they call spot meetings. And a spot meeting is a meeting which comes up um, with very little advertisement that is speaking to people in the community. They were told that at the meetings, people were supposed to be uh, three feet apart or, or whatever, and however you measure three feet. And, and people were reminding people to continue to maintain that. But what they did, which I thought was great, was that you would have a spot meeting, you would have a video recording, and it would be um, repeated in different locations across yeah. the country on flat yeah. screen. So you were encouraged to come out to your, your, your flat screen event, basically, and sit on a, on a, on a path, which was very big, and, and watch the meetings. And, and that was, was a very interesting. The, the Barbados Labour Party did a better job of it, of yeah. taking it to the community. Yeah. The Democratic Labour Party, they centralized most of their meetings at their headquarters, and they broadcasted it from their... Um, and they were able to speak to, to, to people in that way. So I think in Grenada, we'll have a virtual campaign. Um, it's far cheaper for the political parties. So mm -hmm. there were shirts yeah. given away, you know, but ultimately um, the, the, the lot of paraphernalia and foolishness just ends up in the gutter after the election. There, there wasn't a lot of that this time. And the cussing particularly was, was non-existent. You know? um, so the yeah. political <laughs> peak on and thing. What I think I saw I, I, I saw some cousin Peter, but I have a question for you. We we'll get to that later. <laughs> what I thought is interesting with the virtual as well is that the issues are going to be discussed a little more and, and, yeah, and brought to the meat. people. There's, you know. more there's more meat. Yeah, yeah, and you know, in a wine and dance, you don't see that. It's more about other things than, than issues. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I mean it to me that is the positive thing of using that type of media and that type of uh, modality. The issue, of course, is the excitement and the base. And I'm, I'm glad you touched on the spot meetings because I mm -hmm. think that is, it, it becomes a little harder work for the constituency representatives to go out and bounce through and, and have these spot mm -hmm. meetings. But it is what it is in this environment. So it's going to see which party is going to maximize that it as powerful. it goes forward. Yeah. It's powerful. Yeah. I mean, you saw Motley sitting on stones, sitting on benches, people mm -hmm. on the grass. It was intimate. It was beautiful. Yeah. yeah. In, in the in the <laughs> Peter in the local situation here, we've had uh, a reorganizing, restructuring of the main opposition party. We know that they have taken on a very youthful um, dialogue or, or or focus or thrust, and emphasizing all things youth. Um, how um, is this a, a and the fact that we've had. A, lower than normal, um, I would say, uh, voter turnout of young people generally, not only Grenada, but regionally. Um, is this a recipe for victory in your view, um, such a clear focus uh, dimension? Yeah. No, the, the, the NDC has an important role, and I don't think that many people understand the importance of the role that the NDC has in terms of helping to understand how a political party that is beaten and beaten badly um, what it has to do to get back in office. And I think that, unfortunately, the NDC is, is, is worse off in the region now because it's, it's lost all the seats three times. Um, what they have done now by attempting to finally do something different, to me, speaks volumes about the extent to which they now understand that they've been making mistake after mistake by essentially bringing back the same people with the same message, attacking Dr. Mitchell and expecting it to work. Um, they have turned a new page now with a new leader. The leader is young. Clearly, they're trying to use a young person to appeal to a young demographic. 
I don't know if it will work. Um, you know, I always tell people that um, the Pope, for example, uh, has a large following among young people. The um, president, in terms of the presidential race, the, the, the individual, his name eludes me now, who has the most young people supporting him is actually the oldest candidate in terms of, of the democratic race. So there is not necessarily a reasonable assumption that this new leader, because he's young, will get young people. But I think it's a, it's a, a calculated risk that the NBC has taken with good reason to believe that the youthfulness will not only appeal to the young demographic, but it will also signal to people, we have turned a new leaf and that we're going to start to rebuild. The Democratic Labour Party in Barbados is watching because the DLP now has a similar hill to play. Right. Uh, and I think that the, the young person, certainly being there is one part of it. He has to build out a team that is also similarly youthful. Youthful importance because uh, the, the team has to be able to take a political lash and, and continue. So they need to be young enough to be able to you know, survive uh, a beating or two uh, every five years and still be in a position to take, take leadership later on. Uh, and also youth in the sense that they have to bring a new ethos in terms of how they campaign, how they approach people. Um, you know, I, I made a point that one of the things I like about the new leader is that he, he has no, no knowledge of the, the Grenada invasion and the, sorry, the Grenada revolution and the invasion that followed. And I think that too much of your politics in Grenada, and I say this with the greatest of respect, has been colored by who was in, who was out, who was supporting um, the, the invasion, who was opposing it, who was part of that, that revolutionary government, uh, who was part of the coup. And a lot of that colored the whole conversation to the point where the NDC has suffered badly uh, because the NDC was seen as being you know, a force that was not progressive in that regard. Um, the, the fact that he is young enough to not be able to have to carry that political baggage is important. History is important, uh, and I, I think that your Grenada history is fascinating, and I'm a student of it myself. But I also feel that politically, it's important to speak a language that can look past that and say, look, I'm concerned with the fact that we have to get education back on track. We have to get the economy moving in different directions. You know, we have to do all these things that have absolutely nothing to do with the, the, the invasion, the Grenada revolutionary period. And, and I think that he is he's well placed to carry that message forward uh, and to be able to use it effectively. What about the leadership issue in terms of age? You know, we have a youthful leader on the opposition side and we have a, a more seasoned person on the incumbent. Mm -hmm. What you think that has any influence in swaying voters one way or the next, Peter? I think it is a double-edged sword. I mean, Dr. Mitchell runs on the beach still, I think, does it? Yeah. Yes. yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, and I see him dancing at political meetings, and he always makes this point of dancing, you know, so that people can see you feel like young, you know, I'm not really young. Um, you don't have to be young to have an appeal to young people. Uh, I think in many instances in politics, youth is also seen as a disadvantage because yeah. sometimes people feel that experience is more important. So, it's a double edged sword, and it's one that you have to play fairly carefully because your freshness can be good. Um, I remember Tony Blair when he won office in the in, um, in United Kingdom and he basically took Labour back. He was young. Um, he was completely inexperienced because he never sat in the cabinet before. Uh, and that in some ways was a good thing. When um, Prime Minister Gonzalez took over, he made points to say that the first cabinet that he sat in, he chaired. Um, he wasn't young, but certainly in, in politics in terms of that, you, you could bring that youthful energy. So it's a double-edged sword, and he has to play it very carefully as he, as he goes forward. Because the youth can be a good thing, but youth can also be a point of inexperience. And the fact is that Dr. Mitchell is, is, is easily one of the most experienced leaders that we have in the Caribbean. You know, people, especially during this COVID era, want to put their hands in a government, you know, government in the hands of a person who has absolutely no political experience. Um, or will they say, let's stick with somebody who clearly knows what they're doing? My feeling is, in terms of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, a big part of the reason why Dr. Gonzalez got back into office for, for a fifth, um, you know, historic term was simply because people said, you know, we, it is not a time to be taking chances with an experienced person and let's put the, the ship in the hands of a person who knows how to, to sail. Yeah. Is Scott person um, being bold? Sorry. With, um, with, with these sweeping mandates, uh, 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 Peter Wickham, um, you know, the, 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 the sweeping 15 in Grenada and the sweeping 30 in Barbados, um, and, and, and of course that comes from the majority of the voting electorate. Mm -hmm. And there you have, is, is, is clean sweeps uh, becoming a thing where, um, you know, many people are being referred, be, be referring to it 
as undemocratic. Um, because, you know, um, just examine that for us a bit. Because undemocratic how? If, if that is the will of the voters, if the majority in our Westminster system, if the majority of the voters, the people who vote, put the parties in power, and they have these, 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 these clean mm. sweeps. Mm. Um, talk to us about that undemocratic that is mm. taking wave and is becoming sexy language, especially among opposing forces across the Caribbean as it relates to the Barbados sweeps and the Grenada sweeps. Mm. And the second part of that question on those sweeps again, when the governments like Mia Motley, uh, Dr. Keith Mitchell, when they have these, you know, the majority and, and, and total control of the parliament, how then, how critical then does legislation like electoral uh, reform, campaign financing, mm. how critical do those sort of elements become in the governance of the country? Yeah. Uh, I mean, two excellent questions. Um, and I, I think I'm on your side where I want to hear this talk about, democracy, about lack of democracy. And, and I, it doesn't make sense. And to me, a, a 30 love or a 15 love is the ultimate expression of democracy. Um, I think to people who say it's undemocratic, I said, okay, so do, which constituency do you go to? Walk into St. George's and say to them in St. George's that they had no right making the decision that they made to choose the representative that they chose because they should give up theirs in the interest of democracy. So they like the, the NNP candidate. But we say you give up your NNP candidate in St. David's and choose the other person because you believe that it's in the interest of democracy nationally. It, it does not make sense. Yeah. But it is something which opposition forces have peddled largely because they want to scare people into believing that there's something wrong with it. In the case of Barbados, RP sweep preceded what was easily the worst government that we have had in our history, and it was not dissimilar in many ways to, to your experience in Grenada. Um, people went to Prime Minister Motley because we had Fernando Stewart, who was not communicating, who was you know very very ineffective, he wasn't legislating progressively and whatnot. He, he was almost the twin brother of Tillman Thomas, you know, and I say this with the greatest res of respect to both gentlemen, mm -hmm. you know, but a situation. Yeah, their like leadership that occurred, styles are similar. Yeah, their leadership styles are very similar. Both nice men, both bright guys, mm -hmm. but at the same time, both two people who, you know, you often believe whether they wait for the second cup of coffee to wake up in the morning's come, and, you know, the second cup never comes. So it is that kind of a scenario that presented itself. Um, Prime Minister Motley went into office, and in many ways, she was everything that Fernando Stewart was not. We had Fernando Stewart led the, the most powerful, well, the, the least powerful government, and Prime Minister Motley led the most powerful opposition in our nation's history. There was a majority of one, and that continued for uh, a five year period. And in that instance, the, the situation was not very different. All, all of what we said about Prime Minister Stewart in terms of his, his, um, his essentially the weakness of his government, he had the same powers that Prime Minister Motley had indeed. He prolonged the life of his parliament um, almost for the full three months after it was in existence because he had the power to do it. Prime Minister Motley calls an election nearly and people say she's abusing power. And I'm trying to understand how that works because it, it, it doesn't make sense. The Westminster system gives the Prime Minister's tremendous power. Yeah, Tillman sure. Thomas has the same power that, that Keith Mitchell has, for all intents and purposes. Mm -hmm. and, and what's interesting is that in both cases, the constitutional motions um, which were brought by Prime Minister Motley, even though she had all the seats, were stopped because the opposition and the independents conspired to stop it. We don't have a referendum requirement here. In Grenada, you have a referendum requirement, and uh, um, constitutional amendments that were proposed by the Keith Mitchell administration were stopped because the people said, we do not think he has the right to do it. No, were well, the constitutional amendments a good idea? I think they were a brilliant idea. You know, I particularly like the one that helps to deal with the situation where you have no opposition, because clearly it happens in Grenada. But ultimately, the people have the right to vote against it, and they did. So I, I think that this myth that people have that uh, a person that has all the seats is, is more powerful is, 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 is nonsense. Uh, and I think that this idea that it creates dictatorship is something that we have to be very, very careful. And I found that in terms of Prime Minister Motley, the fact that she has all these seats has essentially, she has been more courageous in terms of doing things like in, imposing the Republic and bringing you know, the Republic quickly and removing Nelson and so on. But it has also created a certain uh, willingness to talk to social partners. So the social partnership that we have in Barbados is, to me, is more powerful than it's ever been where every single step along the way in terms of COVID, the social partnership has met and advised on the way forward. 
And I think that there's been a lot of caution in, in her regard in that way. Um, one of the things that she's been talking about doing is creating the opportunity for opposition representation in the Senate, um, which is um, interesting. And I know it's something that you've also considered in, in, in the case of Grenada, uh, institutionalizing it so that when there is no uh, opposition, that you know you have automatically the, the opposition leader's role being fulfilled by the candidate that led the party that, that, that got the second most votes in the election proceeding. Mm -hmm. And um, just the, to the, the legislature, how they, how they govern with the, the sweep. So the things like the campaign financing, uh, corruption in public right. yeah, life, yeah. that kind of legislation, how critical yeah. are those? Uh, and, I, and I agree with you that they're critical. Um, and, and I don't know that in terms of Grenada that we've moved quickly enough to get those in, in place. But what I would say is that in places where there's greater balance, like Antigua, we haven't gotten those in place either. Um, election finance reform is, is an issue that has been challenging for us to deal with. In the case of Prime Minister Motley, what she's done is an interesting thing. Is that they have deposited a um, declaration of their financial uh, status. All of the members of cabinet uh, have done it. They're deposited with the cabinet secretary in anticipation of uh, integrity and public life bill, which has not materialized. It failed in the Senate last time because independent and opposition senators objected. Their objection was on the basis that they felt that judges were not included and they felt that in the same way we should have the declaration for public officers, the judges should also be included. And on that basis, they were strong enough to reject it simply because uh, you need to have at least one person from the independent opposition side in the Senate to be able to get the legislation through. So I would say that Prime Minister Motley has tried. Um, and I, I don't know how much you can argue that Dr. Mitchell has tried, but I can say that the clean sweep doesn't seem to make it any less likely that you will have this, this legislation, even though it may appear to be more important to actually get it. Because the, the challenge of integrity legislation the challenge of um, financing, you know, public campaign finance reform is, is, is enormous. And, you know, I've worked in that area. Um, I, I, I was part of the campaign, the election uh, reform team in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, for, sorry, in uh, the government of, of the St. Kitts and Nevis, sorry, for several years. And, um, you know, we, we basically stumbled on hurdles where the opposition was demanding a whole lot. The government was not able to give everything it was demanded. And some things were just not practical, like the idea that you should ask judges in the same piece of legislation, you should ask judges to declare their finances along with, with um, persons who sit in cabinet, which to me is, is, is legal nonsense. You know, you can't have a single piece of legislation speaking to both of you. Who is going to stand in a adjudication when, when issues are raised if you do it in that way? But the opposition wasn't seeing that. They were saying, you know, bring a suite of legislation that speaks to judges as well. And I agree judges are important, but I think they need to be handled differently. So it's, uh, it's been, uh, I, I would say it's been one of the greater deficiencies across the Caribbean. Um, freedom of information, we have it in, in Jamaica, um, and to some extent in Trinidad and Tobago, but too few of the islands have freedom of information. And that's something that the governments can do and should do, um, you know, for, for obvious reasons. The okay. challenge is that I, I don't know that a lot of them are prepared to do it in small societies because they believe if you have too much information, you're going to punish them. Yeah. yeah. I, I, Peter, believe that, you know, when we're in opposition, we speak it, but when we get in government, forget the campaign reform, financing one and so on. Yeah. I think the, the challenge to me from the clean sweeps is the separation of powers yeah. um, mm -hmm. between the executive, the parliament, and the legislative. And I believe that challenge us with clean sweeps in that you know the same elected officials are the same executive. And that separation gets blurred, I believe. And to me, That's that right. is yeah. one mm -hmm. of the challenges with clean sweeps. And not so much on the demo undemocratic right, nature right. of it. But right. I think that is where part of the mm -hmm. challenge will be in clean sweeps. But Chris, is that not a point also in every other Caribbean country? It is, where it, it is. Right, because is. of the small size. And one yeah. of the issues I've had is that invariably in St. Vincent, they don't have a clean sweep. They have a majority of one, quite frankly. Uh, in, in Antigua, you know, in St. Lucia, 
you have a situation where everyone who is elected to government is on the government side. You don't have a bad bench, and because you don't have a bad bench, that's parliament's right. responsibility yeah. in in, in the um, back being, is being a, thing. a check and balance, yeah. Yeah. right? Back yeah. bench is an important the check and balance doesn't right. doesn't work. Yeah. You know, it, it throws off this whole idea of the thing. So it not only in the Queen's seat, but in a regular arrangement. Once you put everyone in the government side in cabinet, you you don't have anyone to to join with the opposition it, in the it, UK, for example. Yeah. You can have a backbench revolt and uh, uh, join in with an opposition revolt that can change the government and that can be a real check yeah, and balance of what parliament does. Interestingly enough, in some of our clean sweeps, not all the constituency represent, House of Representatives get an opportunity to sit in cabinet. Yeah. So they kind of end up as backbenchers to some degree, just that we don't have it formalized here and give them the power yeah. as a real backbencher will have. So that is something yeah, that... And, and I mean, the question is, uh, the, the question of proportional representation is that a better model uh, to work with? Mm. Uh, but but, but um, uh, Peter, is Kaja presently working in Grenada? <laughs> and we were working in Grenada client. last, last no, no. month. I'm back, so he has to see. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Peter don't reveal <laughs> political clients. I tried at the top. I tried. I, know, I, didn't, I didn't say who, you know. I said, <laughs> I tried. Working. I tried. Yeah, you know. Don't reveal clients. I tell you this, don't though. Reveal I tell clients. you this, that. Cadres, Cadres invariably does um, political polling in Grenada most years, uh, and I think that it's entirely prudent for for any political party on either side to be doing regular investigations into public opinion. And, yeah. and I'm happy that whoever the client that we work for is 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 um is doing regular, you know, to, to keep an eye on things to understand what people are saying on an ongoing basis. Political parties on both sides, to me, need to do this, not only because I'm opposed, but I think it's, it's good sense to understand where people are. And um, in the case of Grenada, you know, that, that's been happening. So um, it wouldn't be surprising if we were, quite frank. I appreciate Peter, your honesty. Yeah. But Peter, you have a moral obligation too, you know. You ca cadre is comes <laughs> out of the legacy of the great Grenadian pollster, Dr. Patrick yes. Emmanuel. Yeah. So you yes. have a moral obligation. <laughs> yeah, and, and um, of course, that's part of my Grenadian heritage. Um, the, the company was bequeathed to me by Pat Emmanuel, and um, as a result, it, there's a Grenadian institution. The, the other director, is, so the other shareholder is, is his wife, who's Grenadian. So uh, we, we do have a, a little piece of Grenada there. So yes, you said it's a moral, moral imperative. <laughs> ah, good. Before I let you go, though, um, in the Barbados election, the Lucille Moore factor, she was a former mm. senator, former friend of Prime Minister Motley, turned political strategist. And she mm. came in at the last moment to more or less try to throw a fork in the road, talking about how dangerous Motley had become and she being so afraid of her and all of that. So the Lucille Moore factor, the impact of that on the one hand. The second thing, out of the Lucille Moore factor, across the region, Wickham, how are voters responding to former bedfellows? You were in bed, you were tight and sweet, yeah. you, you, you come out now, and all of a sudden, your bedfellow is now the devil. How, how, how is the ele electorate responding to yeah. that? Yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting conversation. Um, you, you look at someone like Peter David, for example, who was, was in bed with the, um, the NDC, who fell out of favor with the NDC, and who's found comfort within the bosom of the NNP, uh, and is now a minister in that government. You compare him with the several people who have prosecuted across the region in Barbados. We've had quite a few. Um, and the interesting thing about Prime Minister Motley's cabinet, she has about three or four people in there who were candidates or who ran uh, in the other side. There's an individual who ran against her in her constituency, and he's, he's part of her team. So um, the flip-flopping in, in terms of Caribbean politics is, is nothing new. I think the challenge that Lucy Moore had, though, is that it, it was more personal than political because mm -hmm. In, in many of the instances where it happened successfully, and it wasn't only her, it was another lady called uh, Lynette Holder, who was a senator, who um, you know basically also came out and, and, and came out against Prime Minister Marley. Um, the issue that they have is that when you're not a candidate, it, it, it seems to have less of an impact um, in terms of the political outcome. And then you, you have to have something really scandalous to bring to the fore. You know, in terms of, of um, you know, some information that you're bringing, some, something heavy. What Lucille Moore brought, basically, was that, you know, my best friend no longer has time for me. And, um, you know, she's now the prime minister and she's, she's, I'm afraid of her. 
Um, I wasn't afraid of her for the last 50 years. Mm -hmm. I wasn't afraid of her when I served in her cabinet, but because she fired me from the cabinet, um, and not only then, but several months passed after she fired me from the cabinet, and I have now decided that I am afraid of her. Uh, Lucille Moe uh, was a member of the Senate for a long time, and she never showed up. She was busy doing political consulting across the region, as, as do I, and I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. But, you well, know, well, you have, let's just say you have more, more success. Well, <laughs> anyway, I do think so, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, um, but you know, she and she, she's worked in Grenada as well. Huh? She's worked in Grenada in the past as well. Um, but, you know, the Prime Minister should have taken action against her in terms of her role in the Senate and the fact that she wasn't showing up for work. She never did. Uh, and then this person who stood behind her, then she, she turned out and she attacked in the final days of the campaign because she found a, a client, which was the Democratic Labour Party, and she was a strategist for the BLP. I okay. think it hurt Prime Minister Molly personally. It didn't hurt her politically. I think it helped her politically because many yes. people said, you know, this thing is clearly personal. But um, I think that, you know, when you when you interact with her on a personal level, she said it hurt to know that a person who was her friend for 50 years has, has gone south largely because she was fired from the cabinet. Um, and the reason she was fired from the cabinet was a non-performance because the cabinet was too big. And, you know, the prime minister needed to peer it down. Um, she was not a politician. She was essentially recruited because she was one of the prime minister's best friends. Uh, and I think there was good reason to believe that she should have been released along with the two or three others that were released and, and, and still run as candidates this time around. Hmm. Interesting. So, so hardly Henry yeah. saying that a political strategist should be should not be seen or heard, seen or but heard. they should be felt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And I, I think that was a, that was a brilliant quotation. Yeah. Uh, and I should make the point that I am a, I'm not a strategist, so no, I, no, you... <laughs> I'm a different type of consultant. The strategist should be seen and not heard, but the, the other variety of consultant, which is the, the pollster, um, can often be heard as well as, as, as seen. <laughs> yeah. And just to, the, the woman factor as well. I mean, across the globe, mm -hmm. um, you know, folks are saying, you know, the future is women you know, in leadership, politics, yeah. wherever people are. But for the, 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 the black woman, our ethnicity, what we're seeing happening is when we show up, especially when we show up with our natural hair. I mean, I'm a woman who loves my natural hair, and occasionally mm. I buy natural hair. <laughs> um, <laughs> and we show up with our natural hair. From our people, especially from our, our women, our, our, our ethnicity, there seems to be this cup criticism and this stigmatism of that, you know, okay, so you're the prime minister or you're the minister or you're the judge or you're the television mm. uh, presenter, that you shouldn't show up looking like that. You should fix your hair. And in Barbados, there was specifically the case of Marsha Caddell. Um, the yeah. attack was really to get her to, up against her and her husband. Nasty, nasty attacks, mm. which came from men on the platform and yeah. women too. But they also made a lot of reference about Marsha's mm. natural hair. And I think one of the things, what's appealing about Marsha is how she shows up, yeah. her aura, her hair, the way she dresses, and so on. But I really want to comment on how women are still in 2022, how mm. women, black women, are, are, are mm. still being vilified because of how they show up in terms of their natural hair. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're on point in that regard. I, I've done a, I did a study for UN Women on women in leadership and politics, and uh, we discussed it on another place in Grenada as well already. And the findings are interesting in terms of people's expectations from men and women as far as their politics is concerned. And that is fascinating in and of itself. Um, and one of the interesting things is the way that women present themselves, that there's a higher bar in terms of the presentation of a woman than there is for the presentation of a man. Um, you look at Hillary Clinton and, and, and Angela Merkel, and people always say that, that Merkel, that she's a very frumpy dresser, you know, because she wears the same thing all the time or whatnot. Barack Obama wore the same two suits, uh, the same color suits, for, for, for eight years, and, and no one even noticed. But the problem is that the woman now, she has this challenge wear a dress where she's expected to appear in public in a particular way. And, and the hair is particularly egregious. Um, Marsha is known as the, the queen of the Afro kinky. And I personally love it, but I can tell you it's a very polarizing issue. I have a good friend who, who lectures at the university. And we have this constant back and forth because she does not like it. She finds it looks untidy and unpresentable. Um, you may not know this, but one of the uh, Steve Blackett, who was a minister in the previous administration, 
he attacked Prime Minister Motley in the 2018 campaign, and one of the things he said is that her hair is never combed and that it looks untidy and unkept. <laughs> and it was a particularly nasty comment that a number of people reacted badly to because the Prime Minister also does natural hair. Yeah. Um, you know, there are many of us who feel that she could do something with it. Um, I don't know. I My thing is a, a person's hair is a person's personality. And, yeah. you know, it's one of the things which definitely stands out. And I agree that, you know, women need to women need to be more aggressive in terms of whether, as you said, they buy their natural hair or whether they braid their natural hair or whether they just wear it. And I guess Marsha wakes up on mornings and she just, you know, she just wears it. It depends on how she feels. And I, I think it's brilliant. But it's unfortunate that in 2021, conversations about the way that women present themselves are are seen as a barrier to their entry into office mm -hmm. and we, we also had a, an attack on the, the fact that uh, Prime Minister Motley didn't have children yeah um, and that, that and was, that was that particularly was. nasty yeah. yeah yeah from a woman no less you yeah. know um, saying that you know the women on the DLP side knew what it was like to, to give birth to children yeah, the women on that. the DLP side are stealing that image you know that they don't know being an auntie could never be in a mother. And I, I, I question I question that kind of conversation because we never say it about men, you know. Men are never challenged, you know, do you have children? Have you fathered children? Have you been a good father to your children? You know, uh, and half of the politicians we have in the Caribbean, you know, uh, not in Grenada, of course, um, their, their, their paternal relations, the fact that they have several children in and out of wedlock, you know, it's never been challenged. You know, people don't ask them if they, they carry um, money and diapers for the children. They don't ask them any of those questions. But why would you be raising those issues with women? It's, it's particularly unfair, and there's a gender bias where that's concerned that I agree with you entirely. Yeah. Gentlemen? No, I'm good. I'm good. Yeah, good. I'm good. <laughs> Thank you. All right. All right, Peter, we have taxed you enough for the morning. No, man, I, I, enjoyed, I enjoyed the morning conversation. It was very stimulating, and it's good sharing with my, my Grenadian folks. So uh, thank you. Thank you for the thank invite, you. and also for the fact that we veered out of UNICEF into, into the politics. <laughs> <laughs> I, I did hear, Peter, that um, Prime Minister Motley have Grenadian con connections with the commissions. That is something we probably need to check. Oh, yes, that's right. Yeah. That's true. Yes, yes. It's, yes. it's the cousin. Yeah. So, yes. Uh, the Caribbean, the Caribbean is one family, yeah. One family, um, and I, I have always, I've always loved that about the region that you know we have the same last names, and and um, I know my my own heritage um, has a, a history in Grenada as well. So yeah, it's yeah. It's, it's just great. Yeah. yeah We're yeah. supposed to be tied to it with Trinidad, but it seems like Barbados and Grenada is becoming <laughs> tighter, especially with its political legacy. Martin uh, and Mitchell now <laughs> seem to be catching up to each other. In, <laughs> in their winning ways, uh, so winning to speak. Ways, yeah, yes. yeah, 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 yeah. All right, Wickham, thank you so very okay. much. Appreciate it. I'm sure we'll be hearing okay. much more for you as we get ready mm -hmm. for our own elections. The bell would mm -hmm. ring at some point. Um, so we'll be glad Great. to have you back. Great. Okay, thanks, Brenda. And thanks. Chris, um, Bye. Take care. Thanks Bye -bye. for consenting. Have a great day. Mm -hmm. And that was uh, Peter W. Wickham. Peter is the principal uh, director of Cadres and a political consultant. Gentlemen, I was quite a uh, airful, mm. mouthful <laughs> yeah. this morning. I thought from the, um, the hesitancy report that was done on COVID, I, I like the fact that, you know, the opposition person he spoke about in Jamaica was coming out so boldly. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, uh, Lisa Hannah. And, I, you know, I, I, mm -hmm. I have said openly that I think our labor movement here and our opposition haven't done enough. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, our labor movement will quick to go out to placards and so on. We see a little mole growing somewhere, but we never quick to go out to that placard and say vaccinate. Mm -hmm. um, and that is a populace that is important for them. Yeah. This is a working populace, yeah. employees that, you know, that needs to in my view, um, be encouraged as strongly as possible to go along that route. And you don't hear them vociferous. They will say, yes, they support it. But they don't come out vociferously enough to say, this is what we want, and this is, must be done, and so on. And, and, and that, that doesn't help, I think, you know, getting a hesitancy. And the messengers here um, are not forceful enough, I think. In yeah, our yeah, case, yeah. There's no hesitancy. advocacy on their that's part. Right, you know, that's right, um, well that's right. But I would like to well see the report being shared with all these um, yes, institutions yes, and organizations. Yes. Um, I think it'd be interesting. I, I think it's timely also. 
But um, I, I, I kind of agree that, um, look, um, there's not a lot we can do to force people. That's right. You know? That's um, right. Mm -hmm. but, but I like the institutional approach that it, it now becomes a, 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 um, an employment requirement. You know, it becomes a requirement if you're going to travel. It becomes a requirement if you're going to go to a restaurant. Mm -hmm. um, but there is a movement also, I think, uh, this weekend in Trinidad, where people are coming together to oppose this. It, it should be. They're using don't it tell. To, to, to topple the yeah, government. To, yeah, it's, it's exactly. an anomaly yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. So the politics um, in the meantime, so many of them are being infected yeah. and are dying. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. amazing. It's an interesting conversation. Very. Small. With yeah, our, with our yeah. politics and our civic season starting, so I suspect, yeah. you know, this is nice. I would like to see how, you know, I'm, I'm very um, interested to see how we are going to run our campaigns. Campaign. Yeah. I, I know a lot of information, probably a lot of attention that have been paid to our Barbados Barbados. Yes. And, yes. you know, the, the whole social media aspect. And, so and, and it's that, a cost factor, Chris. Yeah, it's much it's, cheaper. It's much cheaper, you know. You don't need to bring in these artists and big yeah. rallies and transportation. Yeah. And, so if you remove this, it's probably... The you one, can, the you one can thing. have artists, but you can have them virtual. virtual. Yeah. Because yeah. As, as, as a Barbados yeah. Labour yeah. Party virtual. wrapped their campaign yeah. on um, Tuesday night, virtual. they had a big yeah. party. Virtual and they party, tried yeah. to keep the people away, but they converged. Yeah. And yeah, it was, okay. it was a huge And I think the other party. critical thing is voter turnout. Voter turnout. voter turnout in Barbados was low this time. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, um, but not as low as they predicted. Yeah, mm -hmm. traditionally it's low, but in, in that favors the incumbent. Yeah. So it would be interesting to see how it and happens. registration, right. registration. Yeah. I mean, um, yeah. uh, persons must know that registration is an ongoing thing. If you turn 18, you need to register. Yeah. Um, else you're not going to, you'll have to express Well, I saw opinion. our electoral office put out the first set of lists already. Yeah. And okay. asking people to start to check to see their see names and their things. Yes, I saw, yes, in, in, I saw okay. that. Place. I saw so that, that is that okay. is already um, an indication that they are preparing and getting ready for this mm -hmm. um, possible mm -hmm. call. Do you so, guys think we're close? Well, yeah. I mean, Prime Minister did say it's 2022. He liked this. He wouldn't wait till full term to yeah. 2023. So the indication yeah. is sometime this year, but we don't know when that bell will ring. But mm -hmm. I mean, the pundits are saying it's either March or June. So you're hearing different people. Yeah. Pontificate. No oh, is he giving pundits. multiple messages, <laughs> mixed messages that he really don't want to tell you? Yeah, well, give you indication. Yeah, when the last comment when was. When he was right? out the last yeah. time, I found it very interesting. Yeah. I mean, maybe I, I overthink things, yeah. but sometimes it works for me. I found it very, very interesting. He made a point. I think he was following up on a question Johnson Richardson asked him. And one thing about our prime minister is you, when he speaks, you pay attention to everything. <laughs> yeah? And he made a point that he said, you know, and I'm summarizing here, paraphrasing rather. He says, you know, you know, a lot of people come and they say, oh, you know, why call a thing, man? Catch them now. You know, yeah, they, yeah. They, they, they're element disorganized. Of, element of surprise, they're yeah. whatever. They're whatever. Yeah. You know, he said, but I don't think that's healthy. Yeah. You know, that I would try to take advantage of a situation. Yeah. And he went on and he elaborated. Yeah. Yeah. There's some reason that is the one thing in that entire interview that has stayed with me. Yeah. And it has stayed with me for the point that if you're coming up against this gentleman, you better be ready. And don't take that thing at face value. Mm. This is probably a subliminal notice. Well, Get you know, yourself together. Your, I minister. could be wrong, but I have, I have read that thing so many ways. And I don't know, everybody was paying attention to all of the little nonsense, yeah. but that stuck with me. Region. Our prime minister is one of the most experienced politicians in the region. Yeah. So, I mean, he, he knows and I think he understands timing better than most people. people timing. Yeah. And, that, and, that, timing. and that, is, yeah. that is one gift he has yes. as a politician that has worked for him. Yeah. Has worked for him. So, yeah. um, it's been interesting to see what, what that so does. So, he can time. also distract you. Of course, of course, and that's what I'm but saying. But destruction is the name of the, the game. Of the game. Yeah. And why are you there? Why are you there trying to pull the cream off yeah. the real coffee down there? Yeah. Actually, yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. So, it's, it's so you listen be, and yeah. you listen, you know? Yes, and, and, and as I keep saying, he's a very smart politician. Oh, that absolutely. goes without saying. I mean, absolutely. no matter how we feel about this gentleman, his politics, whatever, he is a shrewd human being. Yeah. There are human beings that come to earth that God 
when he created them, he placed some extra gifts in them. Yeah. And whether we like him, whether we don't like him, this man is one of them. But the other thing he, he does, is one of he does them. well, Brenda, he, he also has a lot of information available, statistical information. Well, he's a statistician. A yes. He's a statistician, we, we, mathematician. We underestimate that part of his preparation. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, how they target, so, how so. they do what they do, and so on is well, well coordinated and supported so by a lot of information. He's calculating, so, he's so forecasting, they he's doing They don't doing guess all of that. a lot of the things. They know exactly the demographic, yeah. how you need yeah. to target this demographic, how you need yeah. to get them to vote, yeah. get them to the polls. Yeah. They, they do a lot of background Pe research. People of, that, yeah. people of that ilk and skill, they yeah. have eyes around a corner. Yeah. Yeah. More yeah. Like, <laughs> and that, that level More of preparation less. is critical to success as well. Mm -hmm. so, you it, know, it does, yeah. yes, yeah, it does. So. And I think and there's the same science that, he, you know, his training, mm -hmm. I think that when he talks about COVID, mm -hmm. that's where it comes from. Yeah, yeah. He really does not speak about the COVID as mm -hmm. a politician. And I yeah. He has not been hard and forceful yeah, and yeah. aggressive. And, you yeah. know, he I, really talks about we it. We made a, a good point in, 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 in the Barbados election that state, the focal state. point was how you handle COVID. Mm -hmm. And I think that is going to be a focal point here as well. well when I looked at the coverage Monday night, I mean, Hart B. Henry, one of the most brilliant yeah. political analysts ever, he made the point that these elections really and truly, no matter what you say about the economy, who old, who young, who stale, who whatever, mm -hmm. that these elections across the region are being, is a referendum from the people on how the political electorate handled the COVID, the well, pandemic. Yeah. St. Lucia was a clear example. Yeah. Oh, yeah. gosh. Yeah. Yeah. Lord, yeah. So. yeah. Yeah, so I mean, let's see. Yeah. I mean, guys, I mean, interesting yeah. times ahead. I think so. I think so. <laughs> yes, interesting times ahead. Well, that's our program, everyone. Thank you. You've all stayed with us. So I guess it was quite interesting for you as well. Uh, go out and have a really good Monday. Have a great week. Senator De Ali and Mr. Campbell, thank you guys so very much. Tie. Uh, this is. Yes, hmm. yeah. I, won't, I won't say anything. <laughs> And another new shirt from the collection. We'll talk yeah. about the time next week. <laughs> Have a great week. Have a great, great week, everyone. Yeah. Uh, for the uh, team here, it's been a long Monday morning. Our executive producer, Richie Oliver, our director, Blondell George, Nazim Benjamin, for his professional streaming services, and Kirk Oliver, who kept us crisp and clear. Thank you, all the, the broadcast entities who carried us. And um, that's it. I'm Brenda Batiste. Join us again next Monday for another perspective. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye, guys.